Hi everyone and welcome to the OTT Verse podcast. I'm your host Krishna and today we are joined by a very special guest, the CEO of Bedrock Streaming, Jonas Engwall. Jonas is a specialist in both technology, business and operations and is here today to share his thoughts on the forecast, the future of the OTT revolution, what the next year brings for us and how broadcasters can very seamlessly enter the OTT space and make a killing out there in a very competitive market. Hi Jonas, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, for the benefit of our audience, can you introduce yourself and Bedrock Streaming? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for having me, by the way. Um, maybe I'll start with Bedrock and then I'll come back to, to me. So Bedrock is a company building video streaming platforms. Uh, that's basically the only thing we do. Um, we're based out of Europe. We have 15 years of experience. We have approximately 400 people, most of them engineers and obviously product people as well. Uh, we have almost 50 million users oh, and uh, we focus on anything streaming. So SVOD, AVOD, hybrid. In terms of content, we have uh, obviously VUD content. We have uh, linear channels, we have live sports, you know, so we have pretty much everything you can think of. Uh, we cover most devices. We It depends a little bit how you count. The way we count, we get to 60 plus devices. Uh, so, so, yeah, we, we do uh, most of what you can think of. Sorry, for, for big uh, professional video streaming uh, platforms. Um we have um, we have our head office in Paris, and but we are spread out over Europe. Most people in in, in France, but uh, people all over the place. Um, a, a bit about me, uh, I've been with the company. I'm I'm kind of the founding CEO of what Bedrock is today. Bedrock is a joint venture since almost four years um, <clears throat> between. Uh, MCs, which is a French uh, broadcaster, and RTL Group, which is Europe's largest uh, media company, part of the Bertelsmann Group, by the way. Okay. Um, yeah. And uh, I've been doing media and tech for more than 20 years. I've been, now I'm back to Europe, uh, back in Europe for the last uh, four years. Before that, I was all eight, nine years in Asia. Nice. including two years in India and uh, <laughs> a lot of places. That's a bit about my background. So do you miss India at all? <laughs> do you mean uh, sort of Now it was, I mean, uh, I left India uh, 20, uh, 2012 or 2013. So it's a long time ago. It was, it was a pretty tough experience. Okay. It was really interesting. It was really interesting. I had a, Really good uh, two years, um, but it was also equally tough. It's totally different from what I was used to, okay. uh, but it was really nice. It was a good experience. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay. So my first question might seem a little odd. Uh, the OVP or the end-to-end -end streaming market uh, has a lot of competition. So what would you call out as Bedrock's USP? What's your strongest uh, point? Uh, what makes you different from the rest of your competition? So... We are, um, to my knowledge, we are the only strategic player um, that has this kind of footprint and is also open uh, to working with external companies. <clears throat> I mean, um, we have a pretty large universe within the joint venture kind of group, oh. but we also have external partners uh, around the table. And um, we see ourselves we don't see ourselves as a tech vendor. Mm -hmm. We see ourselves as a partner. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, there's lots of nuances and lots of differences. I'll, I'll just give you a very brief overview. Now, the people around the table, uh, what makes us, let's say, uh, wh where there's a good fit is our platform is top-notch. We, we spend a lot of money and a lot of effort uh, uh, making sure that that's the case. And the ones that really benefit are companies, media companies that have probably been the largest broadcaster or media company in their country, in the in the in the legacy world. And they want to continue to being that, but in but pivoting into, into streaming. 
So they take streaming very, very seriously. So <clears throat> um, what what they get uh, from us is, is obviously the tech platform uh, that is continuously evolving. And all of that is an, it's an all-inclusive kind of uh, setup. As the product, uh, product and platform evolves, all of that becomes available to all the stakeholders. Okay. And that is very important because it's really difficult, as you know, if you today would set out the brief and say, these are the things I need for my streaming platform, and then you go to talk, talk to a couple of companies, uh, if that takes two months, for sure your brief is already outdated. <laughs> you know, something has happened, etc. So it's really difficult to keep up. So I think this and also the fact that we have uh, major players from different countries all sitting around the table, learning from each other. So there's a, a super, you know, um, unique atmosphere with best practices and learnings, etc. So it, all of this comes as a, as a very neat package, and I think this is what uh, what differentiates us from from a lot of other people. I That's think we're the only one I I know that can offer this basically. That's great. It's it's almost a natural segue into my next question. Um, so when I when I look at the when I look at the uh, industry and uh, companies trying to launch themselves or coming into the OTT space, uh, there are a lot of uh, content providers who are probably on YouTube or other platforms like that who are very good on content, very low on tech, and they just pick a vendor and go with them. Uh, but the kinds of people that you just spoke about have traditionally large tech teams to handle broadcast, handle cable. Uh, so I can imagine their business owners and product owners uh, being in a bit of a dilemma. Do I build or do I buy? Uh, so when you meet such a prospect, when you see meet such a person, right? Uh, what is your advice? How do you help them navigate? Because these are people coming from a legacy mindset, right? Mm. Uh, what's your suggestion? What's your thoughts on this? So I'll give you some some numbers, and I, this is what I normally do when we have this kind of conversation. Um, it's very it's very easy to get sucked into I should build and I should own my own tech, right? Because that's a natural approach. It's totally it makes total sense. The only problem is for most countries and co sorry companies and in normal countries. When I say normal countries, I mean. I exclude US, India, China, who are huge markets, right? So co companies operating in, in other countries will have a hard time finding scale in their market. Hmm. If you're in there, if you're in US, you will find scale in your own market. That's okay. So <clears throat> uh, when I say scale, if you if you are a leading broadcaster in in a in a evolved country and you want to have a top-notch streaming platform uh, you will be paying somewhere around the very lowest 50 million wow. to probably around 100 million or even 150 million on a yearly basis just to keep the tech running wow. um, and that's not counting any marketing content anything like that right so it's it's the tech making sure the tech is smooth and good and, and seamless and all that, all that kind of stuff. I'm not saying that you cannot build a platform for less money. You, you obviously can, but I'm just saying from, from the data points that I have with people I, I know really well and they tell me how much they spend. So it's totally fine. If, if you're okay spending, you know, 50, 100 million, that's fine. Then off you go. If you want to build yourself, then at least you have the money. Then yes. you, you counter all the problems, finding rent, right talent, you know, all of that, which is also a real a difficult task. But uh, so I would say for most companies, uh, they don't want to spend that kind of money. Um, and I think there you automatically come into kind of some kind of a buy scenario where where you are optimizing your 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 structure a bit. And I think that's for me, I think that you're right. A lot of uh, traditional media players, they have a legacy mindset. They think that they need to own the tech. And I think that most of the reasons are probably not that relevant. They're more emotionally connected, etc. But And I think that a lot of people, they start out this route because nowadays everyone has a platform, right? So they start out this route and a lot of people um, feel the pain of, of, of doing this, right? Uh, 
it's one thing when you when you invest money it's the fun part right when you invest money and build a platform yeah. everyone is focusing on it it's cool new features is coming right. out and then when it comes out then you realize ah i have to maintain all of this <laughs> and there are new things coming all the time and there's a new device and etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's a really difficult task to 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 undertake basically so yeah, you you are learning also, from others mistakes as well i guess yeah yeah correct uh so uh, i i get this perspective of yours uh, is there also a minimal set of features that you usually advise people to launch with uh, because you could get sucked into this product trap right i want this feature i want this let me also add a button to add to list and then reminder uh, where do you stop where do you where do you say let me draw a line here launch and then i'll see what happens uh, what do you usually uh, advise yeah so yes of course you do um minimum uh, viable product or minimum level of product of course you need to find a line but however the way i see it it's fairly simple in most markets where where someone is launching or is evolving their own streaming platform if they're a local player their users will also have a netflix account they will also have a disney account they will also have a spotify or whatever it is yeah. so to me there is kind of a streaming standard there's a global streaming standard out there it's not 100% aligned but you know if you want to be top notch you, you you don't need to have every single feature out there but you need to have i don't know what 80 90% because it's expected it doesn't mean that every every feature is used all the time by every user but it's there you know because once in a while on netflix you want to do something and you know the feature is there and then when you get to that other local platform if if you try to do the same thing and then the feature doesn't exist you will get annoyed right as a user so that's the to yeah. me i think there's this this global uh, streaming standard that if you're really serious about streaming you need to more or less follow it and of course the standard changes right it, it evolves it gets better <clears throat> but uh, you need to hover somewhere around that standard absolutely uh, i guess part of the standard which uh, many companies are trying to crack is personalization right it's uh, it's this uh, uh, gorilla the big gorilla in this room right uh, where everybody is saying hey we are a hyper personal platform but then you spend 15 minutes trying to find your latest movie uh, where do you see this heading right what's your perspective you're working with millions of users millions of devices Uh, what's your take on this what what do you think people are doing wrong what do you think they should do also do to solve this problem so i think first of all i think you're right personalization is really difficult it's the holy grail of streaming yeah uh, it's also the first thing people cheat on right so when 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 people launch a platform or for probably even many years depending on who it is the platform isn't personalized uh it why because it's so difficult to do it properly and then also i would say i've heard anecdotal stories about people who have bought a platform and they said in the brief i want to have personalization hmm. and often the brief is <laughs> <laughs> not so specified it says personalization yeah okay great they receive the platform and then they say where is the personalization and the vendor says yeah yeah but here you have this row uh, picked for you or whatever it's called <clears throat> content made for you so basically sometimes personalization can be one single row okay now the way we approach things we uh we personalize everything so to speak in the platform you you arrive on your mobile the experience will be different from your tv if you are watching i don't know football content and it's a football week the experience will be different for you versus someone that likes cooking shows or whatever it is right so it's not just one row uh it is everything it's colors content uh, so there's and 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 i think that coming back to your question i mean it's this is fundamental and i think uh, a lot of people including netflix talk about a one to one relationship you you ideally you want to create a one to one relationship um, what i normally say is we want to have 80% of our content when i say content i mean the thumbnails and pictures i'm not talking about the video oh. uh, we typically talk about 80% uh, 
programmatic. When I say programmatic, it's personalized in, in numerous different ways. And then you probably leave 20% or so for the content owner to editorialize. Because if, if you take even Netflix, you know, when the crown launches, it doesn't matter if you're 15, 65, a girl or a guy, for sure you will get the crown, you know, <laughs> somewhere. Yeah. So, so I think that's that's totally fine, right? That makes total sense because if you're investing heavily in those titles, you want to push those, right? So that's totally fine. So I think that's that's um, what I can say. I, I uh, let me also give you another stat. One of our um, partners before joining Bedrock, they told us well, one of many of their uh, challenges was they only use two or three percent of their content catalog. Wow. Why? Because it was not personalized. They were pushing the same content to everyone. And obviously, people, they yeah. consume what they get in their face, but they, they miss out on a lot of stuff, right? So that's also a very important element. It's really to, to unlock. If you have a big, I mean, the, the bigger catalog you have, the more important it is to unlock this and give people ways to find all, this, uh, all these go golden nuggets, right? Very interesting. Uh, I just want to quickly touch upon something you mentioned. Uh, you're saying that actually you're you're able to personalize the UI itself. Something like a cooking week versus a Formula One week. Uh, yeah. If I'm interested only in Formula One, does my UI look a little different? Is that what you mentioned? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, it's not just about the let's say uh, let's say it's Formula One week. Okay. So Formula One fan comes into the platform that will have a different experience wow. from. I don't know, cooking or whatever it is. I'm okay. using a bad examples here. But let's say if you're a cooking fan, yeah. you won't care about Formula One. So even if it's a Formula One week, you simply won't notice, right? You will, uh, I mean, maybe somewhere it's mentioned, right? But you will enter into a different experience. And like I mentioned, depending on the device, it can look different. I mean, all of this stuff is ultimately up to the content owner to, the, to decide, right? They, they, they might... They might want to force everyone to see Formula One. That's fine, but if they if they don't want to, then they separate the experience, and they can do that for. I mean, they can create lots of different um, categories, etc., and and clusters. Fabulous, fabulous. Uh, shifting gears slightly towards business, uh, we're seeing a lot of ad uh, supported platforms being launched. A lot of companies now saying, okay. We have been sustaining on subscription-based uh, plans. Let's also introduce ads. Uh, what's your take? How do you see the industry evolving? Is it hybrid? Is it purely award? Are people able to make their money back? Got it. <laughs> Million dollar question, right? <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll give you an example from our experience. Yeah. We had, let's say, two years back to be to be make it cl more clear. Okay. Two years back, we had. AVOD platforms or SVOD platforms. Today, with no exception, mm. the SVOD platforms had added AVOD mm. and the AVOD platforms have added SVOD. So everyone is a hybrid, okay. which to me makes total sense. I mean, like you will always have customers having more time than money and vice versa. So to me, having that those levers to play around. So what you can do with our platform as an example uh, you have four, I think, categories of things you can play with to create the best experience for a user. So you can, for example, you take a, a, um, a low, lower or even free. Let's say you can even go free and you say, okay, in the free package or the free offering, I'm not going to offer big screens. I will offer more. I'm making this up. Only mobile. Oh. Uh, I will hold back certain content. I will have lots of ads and I will not allow certain features. Okay. And then the other extreme, you have uh, no ads or maybe somewhere in between. You have uh, no ads. You, you give more, more features. You give more content. So you can, you can play with features, content, ads, and devices. And, okay. and you can combine all of those four into into a package that kind of helps the user and optimizes your way to monetize. And I think this is only the beginning, right? If you take, um, I mean, obviously free is great. If that, that's how it works. If I look, it's obviously different when you look at different markets. If you look at Europe, you have a lot of traditional free-to-air players who became AVOD platforms 
and then offer an SVOD package, they okay. tend to cost three, four, five euros, which basically means often better content, uh, less ads or almost no ads, um, and a better experience. And okay. if you think about it, three, four, five euros, that's the Starbucks coffee that you pay <laughs> once a month. Right. And if you're, if you're watching content on a regular daily basis, that's a pretty small investment to make your experience better. So I think people like Spotify have done a great job in teaching people to pay. And I think it's a matter of time because I think that it's a very small investment. I understand if you're never watching, if you watch once a half a year, you will, you can watch the ads, you can suffer a bit. It's okay. But if you're watching constantly, I think a lot of people will take those comfort packages um, and thus the, the content owner can monetize a bit better. Very true. I mean, it, what you're saying actually translates into my head as content is king, right? If you have the yeah. right content, you have the right audience, then yes, you will find a way to make them pay. Uh, so we, we have a saying, I'm not sure if someone else does this too, or maybe I'm stealing it from someone, I'm not sure, but at least we say, and people, it resonates with people, content yeah. is king, but uh -huh. platform, uh, platform is queen, which to me is equally important, right? You the, yeah. Obviously, content is always first, but you need to have a strong, good platform to, to convey the content to the user. Absolutely. And just going back to a couple of uh, minutes ago, you mentioned that one of your uh, customers uh, were not able to exercise more than 2% of their uh, content. So with the right platform, discovery gets improved, search gets improved. You can bubble up all those latent long tail content, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, fabulous. Uh, okay. So uh, Jonas, now let's assume that we have launched a service right? after, let's say a year of running my service, giving discounts, giving coupon codes, all of that. I have built an audience. My audience appears to be loyal. Uh, but as my revenue comes in, I also see that my costs are increasing. Right, storage costs are increasing, CDM costs, cost of running my servers, uh, my vendor might have changed their uh, charges, uh, all of this. Uh, so you are, come to this inflection point, right? Uh, cost versus revenue. Uh, that I've, I've spoken to a lot of OTTs in the past, and this seems to pinch them a lot. Uh, what do they do as the next step? Uh, you have seen businesses in your long career. Um, are there technical knobs that they can exercise or business knobs? Uh, just a free flowing question to you. I mean, obviously, there's there's lots of levers you can pull, etc. I think the, the the basic underlying challenge is when you get a new technology like OTT and streaming coming along, then suddenly everyone thinks that okay, I need to have a platform and it's going to be the solution to the future, etc which is i think the case for <clears throat> for some players okay. but i i mean i simply i simply think this is my personal view huh? i simply think that there are way too many streaming platforms out there so the, 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 that's just the, the the simple economics of things right they they will consolidate just because you own you have to own a lot of content to be able to sustain a, a streaming platform without consolidating without uh, merging with someone so I think you will see, um, I mean, you have the big guys, you have the big uh, US uh, uh, studios. Of course, they are in a position to to have um, a, a successful streaming platform. It's going to take a while, but I think they're going to get there. Same applies to big local companies. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, beyond that, I think that you're going to see a lot of consolidation or you will... Uh, you know, a lot of content companies will simply sell their content to other streaming platforms uh, because, like you said, it's very it's very costly to acquire those customers, maintain those customers, and then run everything around it. Right. So, cr creating content and selling is, is sometimes a better approach. Yeah, yeah. You license your content into an aggregator, I suppose. Uh, yeah. Okay. Having said all of this, uh, yeah. I, maybe I can mention because you mentioned that tech costs were increasing, etc. Yep. So, um, in our in our world, what we do, uh, we have a pretty much a flat fee. Okay. Uh, okay. There's a small caveat. There's a tiny inflation, obviously, because of just inflation. Yep. Um, and then, of course, if you double your streaming hours, of course, your 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 volume cost or your run cost will go up a bit. But let, let's assume. 
that you're on a steady, steady, um, steady volume, mm-hmm. our our cost will be pretty much steady with a small caveat for inflation. Okay. Why? However, the platform evolution goes very steep upwards in mm-hmm. terms of better stability, better coverage of devices, etc. So why do we do that? It's because just what you said. Um, we want people to have a a way to predict their cost and to really understand how this is gonna uh, how this is gonna pan out, because I think traditionally you have a nonstop debate with your vendor. You want another feature. Yeah. It's gonna cost this much, and it's really difficult to predict your your cost basically. Absolutely. Uh, just a question. Suppose one of your partners comes and says, uh, "I'm running my own platform, uh, but for just." The- reasons that you just mentioned it's getting very costly for them and they say can you also send a play api can you send a stream to another aggregator there's someone who's starting an aggregation service i also want to send my streams are you in a position to actually help them do this uh, i mean if they're our partner yes so yes. so so um we have there's lots of ways of doing this there's kind of app to app approach okay. so if you're in an or well yeah, you can do mo- both ways, right? You can have an app to app approach okay. where your content I- is discovered I- in an aggregator environment. Yep. And, and once they press play, you as a user very seamlessly end up in, in your own platform. The benefit of that is you're keeping all the data, you have full control. Yep. The, the downside is yes, you're, you're absorbing the CDN costs, et cetera. There's also the other way around, which is more managed services, right? Where you basically are are you're you're consuming the content within someone else's environment. Uh, we we have we have customers doing both. There are pros and cons. I would say I would say the trend is more going towards app to app because again I'm speaking about people who are are high end um, uh, media owners, right? Uh, you, if you if you're a smaller content company, you might want to go a different way because it's cheaper. But if you're if you're targeting to be a um, <clears throat> a um, local streaming champion, you probably prefer to have an app to app approach where you control the data and control the user. Very very interesting. Very interesting. Yes. Uh, finally, we are uh, coming towards the end of 2023 already. We're just a few days away from September. It just feels like January was a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I know. But this has been, unfortunately, a tough year for the media industry. I've seen a lot of content uh, spends being reduced, ad spends, a lot of layoffs. Um, how, how, what has your view been of this year? And how do you see the industry going into 2024 and beyond? I think, um, well, there's no, there's no, um, uh, I mean, I think everyone sees the same thing, right? The, for a while, streaming, was the focus for everyone. Uh, money was for free. You only needed to grow subscribers. I think mm-hmm. this year, or maybe even uh, beginning of uh, end of last year, there was a bit of sanity coming into the, the well, a reality check coming into yeah. everything, yeah. where people started looking. Okay, wait a minute. We have to make money on all of this, and hence you see layoffs. You see streaming platforms increasing their prices, uh, broadening their monetization models. I think this will continue in 24, most likely. I think um, I think streaming is the future and it will be profitable, but not for, for so many. It will be profitable for, for X amount of large players mm-hmm. and then others will merge or they will, uh, you know, find other ways. Um, and I think, uh, unfortunately, tough times will continue. I mean, uh, war and these kind of things are not helping, of course. But uh, I think we have another tough year ahead of us. That's my my guess. I just hope the industry improves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, we, uh, I like your point on consolidation because we are seeing that very clearly in India, at least. Uh, the three major, the major telcos, uh, Airtel, Geo, then there are other Tata, Dish. Uh, they all have these super apps with 20, 25 OTTs inside them. Uh, right. So you can seamlessly search across them. Uh, but then the next question comes, if all the OTTs are in all the apps, what differentiates each of them, right? So uh, I think every solution has a problem. <laughs> exactly. I fully agree. I fully agree. Uh, fantastic. Uh, so Jonas, are you headed to IBC this year? Uh, yes, I am. 
Um, so what's the best way to get in touch with Bedrock Streaming? Uh, if you can tell us your booth number, uh, contact okay. details, we put it out here for our viewers. Sure, we're there. Yep. We are in Hall 5, booth okay. C78. Okay. Come, come, come by, have a coffee or a beer um, if you guys have time. Uh, we wish you all the best and congratulations on your journey so far. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Jonas.